Good evening, uh, Father Bruno Tupan, and uh, welcome to this CP special. Nigeni yukune kasi sentur accent Santa. Lilian wahne. Um, welcome to Christian Panorama. Wow, kerchen la. Komning kodi fara la waherek. And today we are here in Banjo, Holy Spirit Parish. Nigeni hamne ne. Mugi fi Banjo. Was ini anda ak um, Father Bruno Brendan Tupan. Balan yo dem forward, um, linko bayrek. Munu yo, nu yo darias parabi, nu yo viewers and fans of Christian Panorama World Kirchen la. Boka yo yo nalen, ti sen tu laksan santa, di kontan chi wahtan yo manyo wahtan si fi ak Harriet and Marie eh, from. Uh, Holy Spirit, Sending your anniversary, your priesthood. Um, Ezekiel, we have so many questions for you and also for the fans that are watching Christian Panorama. Um, wow, Kerchen La. Um, you are a spiritual counselor and here you are celebrating your Silver Jubilee 25 solid years in the Lord's Vineyard. Wow, congratulations. <laughs> We're going to visit with you here on CP, just like I mentioned. But before we do that, I want us to kindly request or we observe a moment of silence um, for our dear sister who have passed on, Madeline Du, and we pray that her soul will rest in perfect peace. May her soul and the soul of all the faithful departed with the mercy of God rest in perfect peace. Amen. So, Father Bruno, we'll start by asking you, um, let us start from Father Kunda, who Father Bruno, Brendan Tupan is. Yeah, Father Bruno, born in Banjul, actually. Uh, I was born in uh, number two, Grand Street. But uh, when I was young, when I was a small boy, my father died. So my mother went back home to Fajikunda, where her dad was living yeah, next to the church in Fajikunda. And so that is where we grew up. All of us grew up out there. And uh, so we become people of Fajikunda. And uh, growing up in Fajikunda, yes, uh, as a small boy, uh, I, did, I, I, I stayed very little in Fajikunda after we, we moved to Banjul. I don't even remember us living in Banjul. So that's, that tells you how young I was. I don't remember ever living in Banjul. It was later on that. I still lived there. My, my father's younger sister lived there for a long time. And, but I grew up in Fajikunda. After a while, my auntie decided that uh, my mother would not have all of us. My father's immediate younger sister. So she took me to, to Senegal on adop adoption. We didn't work out there very well, and my mom came back for me. Maybe that is the reason why I'm a priest today. <laughs> Maybe it would have been different in, in Dakar. I was living in Dakar in a, in a place called Charwe. Mm -hmm. Charwe, just outside Dakar. That's why I, I lived for a few years, but I came back home. Uh, they were just opening a school in Fadikunda, the St. Charles Primary School. And the people started registering their children. So my, my mother quickly came, ran, ran to pick me so that I could start school there. So I started school not having gone to nursery. Unfortunately for me, I came back home and uh, yeah, I was, I was passing uh, school going age uh, in Senegal and my mom learned that I had not started school. You see, that troubled her. And that's why, that's the reason because there were some issues there. Uh, family issues there. So my mom particularly came from me. So I came back to Fajikuna on a Sunday, I think, and the Monday I was in school. 
it was a bit difficult at the beginning, you know, being in school with people who have already, you know, when they started the school there, some of the kids had already been going to St. Peter's Primary, some to St. Therese Primary. They all came back there to start grade one with us. So they were a bit ahead of me. I struggled in my early years in school, but I was able to catch up. I, I really caught up around grade three. And then we moved on. We lived there, played around there, and uh, did so many things there. Served mass. My first mass, actually, was the, 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 the Thanksgiving mass of Bishop Clary. You know, Bishop Clary came to our parish uh, on Sundays for mass. We were not a parish by then. We were an outstation. And uh, he adopted our outstation. And every, every, every Sunday he came from Fajara uh, as a priest, actually, before he was principal of St. Augustine's here, but lived in Fajara with Bishop Maloney and came to our community every Sunday to celebrate Mass. And uh, so luckily for me, the first day I was to serve, actually at his first Mass there, Bishop Clay was so nice. He had his enthronement at the cathedral. And the very next Sunday, he decided he would come where he used to celebrate Mass. That's why he had his first Mass as Bishop. It was, that's the, that's the blessing that St. Charles has for the Kunda. So he came and that was the day I was preparing to serve for the first time, and I was lucky to be serving Bishop Clary on that day. So I grew up there in that community, a very small, humble community, mostly Mankanch and Jolas. The Mankanch around the Fajikunda, Latukunda, Tabakoto area there, because that's where we all grew up. And then we had Jolas in Jola Kunda. We formed the early community uh, of Christians in Fajikunda. Later on, people came and now. It's a big community. So I grew up there. Later on, I, after grade six of primary school, I moved on to St. Peter's uh, High School then, and from one, from two, before later on, I joined the seminary. So I like Fajikuna, and I know Fajikuna very well. I know the community very well. I saw the community grow from being a small outstation. In the school, we had mass there. The, the, the fathers, when they built the school, they, they, they had some sort of a small hall, and that was divided into two during the week, two classrooms. But on Sundays, we, we removed the, the thing that divided the class, and we had uh, some sort of a mini hall until the church was built later. And I was also privileged to be serving at the first church there, the church there when it was built. I had, I had gone to the seminary by then, but I, I was a mass server then, and we served. So it was an interesting small community that grew uh, and uh, it was fairly independent because we are far from the main station, St. Terence kind of thing. And, and I loved it there and I learned catechism there. I prepared for first so the communion there. Later on, I was confirmed in, 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 uh, in kind of thing. But it was nice, nice <laughs> community. Maybe that was where the seed uh, was uh, planted see that today we are celebrating 25 years later or many years later i should say interesting um but what time in life did you know it's the priesthood yeah when i tell this story you know i never thought about the priesthood really i never thought like living in that community we are far from priest we saw bishop clary michael father clary come to our church uh, on a week, uh, uh, weekly basis on a Sunday. In school, once in a while, people like Father Grimes would come, Father Smith, and they would ask who wants to be a priest. I, I never raised my hand up. Mm -hmm. I didn't even know what it, it meant, how one could manage to be a priest. Uh, so it was, then I went to St. Peter's Secondary School. And uh, the first day I went to St. Peter's, you pass, you know, when you pass St. Peter's, you see some buildings on your left going into school. Later on I discovered after a few weeks that it was the seminary. And then what was the seminary about? He didn't know. I didn't know that. Then later on gradually I came to know that it was young boys who wanted to become priests. Later we had the ones there. But I never I never entered that place. I was I, I told people on, on the day of my 25th anniversary on the 15th of November that I never I was in that place for two years. I never entered the seminary. It was like a no-go area for, for non-seminarians that time. And we, we didn't enter. I passed every day to school and back home. And uh, during my Form 1, Form 2 years, I used to ride a bicycle to school. 
interesting. So maybe that's why I didn't have time to enter the seminary because we all packed our bicycle after school. We waited for each other and we rode home. Uh, later on, my brother came here to have a bike and we had some friends who had bicycles. We used to ride in and out. So maybe that's why I never bothered. Until a day that the director of the seminary by then, Father Robert Ellison, he became Bishop Robert Ellison later, came, he was in charge of the seminary by then, he was director. So he came to preach vocations in our Ari class. So on the day before he came, the Ari, the Ari teacher um, at the time was Sister Yvette. She was a PM sister. So Sister Yvette came and told us that the director, the director of vocations, whatever, whatever name it was used at the time, was going to come and speak to us. So the next day we were in class and uh, Father Ellison came to speak to us about vocation, about the priesthood, about how it was, and anybody who wanted to be a priest is free to make a try. So as he was leaving, he said to us, I'm leaving forms with sister. If anybody wants to try to come and see, you're welcome. At that stage, I didn't even, I was not still not, I didn't show interest. So some of the young men were picking forms, and one of them told me, Sangay, Sangay is a choir master at St. Therese now. Bruno, why don't you take a form? So, so some of the boys took forms. So we all, we all decided to take forms. I was in the same class with Father Emil, the late Father Emil. So we both took forms. I didn't even know Father Emil took a form. So we both took forms and uh, we filled them. Me, I felt I filled mine quickly. The interest was still not there, <laughs> but I was just I was just exploring something. I was the, maybe I was doing all the righteousness demands. I just filled my form and gave it back to sister. In the meantime. Father Ellison left and Father Connati took over, another, another Irish priest took over, Father Peter Connati. I think Father Ellison became the superior of the, the, the Holy Ghost Fathers. So he moved on to Bacau, became superior and moved on to Bacau. This was around May, May June of 2000, 2000 no, what I'm saying, 1985. I went to St. Peter's in 1983, 83, 84 from one, 84, 85 from two. So this was having around May, June, when I got this invitation from one of the seminaries we were living there. But I think it was Father Antoine. Father Antoine was in the seminary a year before me. One of them came and said, uh, they gave me a small note and from the rector, from Father Konati, saying I was invited to the seminary for a common see. So I went in. I went in that weekend. Father Emil, coincidentally, also, was also invited the same weekend. A few boys also came from St. Augustine's Senior Secondary School. These were like the two schools then where you could have, in fact, uh, where seminarians would, would go to. So they came, we had a good weekend, it was nice. And, and then the director met us individually and asked me, what, 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 what do you think your parents would say about you becoming a priest? Already I knew it wouldn't work. <laughs> <laughs> Because uh, from the moment I, I fill the form, I, I, I raised a few things at home and I didn't have a pleasant response, neither from my mom, who was, who was the woman of the house. My father had gone, like I said earlier. And not even from my sisters. They, 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 were, they, they, were, not, they were not encouraging. None, none of them was encouraging. So... When the, when, it, when the Father Connelly said, what about your family? Hmm. I just, I kept quiet. I said, I'm not sure. I said to him, I'm not sure. Because really, it wasn't the best at home for, 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 for priesthood. Because like I said, after my encounter, after filling the form, I mentioned the possibility of becoming a priest and I didn't have good responses. But you see, God is good. And God knows how he does his own things. So gradually, so one day, okay, the priest had said to me, Father Konati, at the weekend, at the common sea weekend, the first weekend, I went for that weekend. Even going to the weekend was a problem when I was invited to that weekend. Well, what will I tell mom at home? <laughs> <laughs> so I didn't want to say I was going for a weekend in December. I just said, the priest in Lamin invited me for a weekend. <laughs> That's all I said. <laughs> So I was allowed to go. But unfortunately for me, the very first weekend I went to the seminary, my sister came in there. They came for some kind of errand. My sister was already in St. Peter's. 
they came there for some kind of errand and met me there undressed already having a meal in the thing so that means my sister knew what i did she went back home and told my mom this woman is thinking about becoming a crystal <laughs> when i say this she doesn't like to hear that now she's embarrassed about it <laughs> so luckily for me okay, i went for that weekend it passed well came back home after a few weeks i think it was in the summer father kwanati came home to to meet my family that was the that was the style then that was the the the, the way things were done the priest would come home and talk to your parents so father kwanati came home with the catechist hmm? they were all wearing uh, cassocks so my mother didn't know the other man who went with father was in the was in the priest so actually they went and really the, the, my 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 mother was surprised to to be visited by priest <laughs> it it was something that was in okay we were living in an outstation and a priest would hardly come home so it was like a blessing for my mom even though she didn't confess to me that it was it was only later on she told me but it was a blessing that two priests came home she felt that two priests came home so when i came back she said some fathers came here and said they wanted you to go and stay with them in the seminary that's all she said and kept quiet but i was also not sure what her response was to to father konati i was eager to know but i didn't have the courage to ask <laughs> because i didn't want to hear the bad news that no you are not going so i just also just kept quiet okay they came she didn't say what her response was, I too didn't ask. <laughs> I just kept quiet until, but two weeks later, I met Father Konate. He came to the school and we, we, we and, and he said to me, oh, I came to your house and your mom was so happy to welcome me. And uh, she's willing to have you come to join us in September. So you're welcome in September. <laughs> it was a blessing. Yeah, it was, it was nice to say, to, to hear the news. I came back home and I said, yeah, Father Konati said, September was school, you'll be like, what not them join seminary? So I was over the moon. Of course, I didn't even know what the priesthood meant at the time, but at least maybe God had put some kind of interest in you or in me at that time. So I was excited to go. So there was September 1985. Don't know, can't remember the date exactly. I packed my bags, <laughs> and there I was in the seminary. Yeah. You were in St. Peter's High School, mm -hmm. and at Lamin, you had mentioned that. And tell us about high school life then in St. Peter's. Yeah, high school life was good. It was good for me. I, I enjoyed it. Um, I tend to be a little bit academic, you know. I do well in exams. So uh, I, I, I was very happy in the school because... Every time I got a prize, a present for, for, for doing well. And the, the, what made me even more happy was after the very first term, Father Como gave me a scholarship for which I still thank him. He, 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 God bless his soul. Yeah. Father Konati used to, he had a way of picking students who, who came from lowly backgrounds, but were doing very well uh, academically. So we enjoyed that with my siblings anyway, not me alone, but with my siblings. I think my sister was the first to get that scholarship. And then later on I came and uh, my other siblings also got it. Well, it was a blessing. So you were there, you were doing your best, but you also had a scholarship. And our scholarship were very good. You got some money to buy bread at break time. And you know, so if you have things like that, you'll be a happy boy in the school. So I was really a happy boy in the school. And, uh, and, uh, and Father Colmer really loved me, you know, he loved me. You know, when you're a principal, somebody's doing well academically, mm -hmm. you, 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 you are bound to love them. And uh, after, after a few years, after two years, Father Kumar retired, okay, became Vicar General. And uh, so, uh, Aunt Teresa Ndong Jata took over. Uh, she was Miss Ndong at the time, and she took over. Uh, she was my English teacher. And she too, we had a pact at that time too, because I was doing well. She found me very, very, very troublesome at the beginning, but even when you are troublesome with the you do academically it balances out <laughs> i really liked her she was very challenging she challenged us in school and uh, today i i write well because of her she really made us uh, taught us how to write imagine you do you did only one essay the whole year until it was perfect you wouldn't do another essay 
and she challenged us. So hey, I had a good time in the school. I enjoyed school life. And then in Form 3, I joined the seminary. So I was both in the seminary and in the school. I enjoyed, I enjoyed life in St. Peter's. I took up sports as well. I started playing. I was very smallish at the beginning, but later on, I gained a little weight. I started playing football. I was in the, the, the school football team, junior though, because I was small. I was in the junior football team. And uh, uh, I was in the team that first drew St. Augustine. St. Augustine used to beat everybody four, not five, not. <laughs> But I was in that team, the junior team, and it was 1-1. One, one. We played it here in San Augustine. So I was in that team. I played football quite a lot. And I also played other sports, basketball, volleyball. So I learned, you know, when you're in the seminary, of course, with the boys, every other day we played some kind of game. So I, I developed interest in sports in the school there. And I, I also, towards the end, I also took up athletics. And I was crowned champion of the 1,500 meters at the end of my Form 5. So I enjoyed school life. High school days were great. High school days were great indeed. Yeah. While you were in high school, you also went through your pre formative years at the junior seminary in Lamen. Mm -hmm. Tell us about junior seminary years. Yeah, I, I enjoyed junior seminary years. It was nice. At the beginning, it was tough for me. Because, you know, when we started there, boys were not doing very well in English language. So Father, when Father Koretti came, you know, he, he realized that you know, some of the students, and in those days you had to get a credit in English to go to the seminary. Mm -hmm. And a few people were really struggling to get a credit in English. English and math those days were so used to be the, the stumbling block. But for, to go to the seminary, you had to, to get a credit in English. So he decided to get somebody, one volunteer was teaching us English language. I will never forget this, this incident. And the man, the teacher, when he came, the very first day he asked us to write, it's about what we would like to become in the future. I, 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 had always, I always have an exploring mind. So when he gave us that, he said, he decided to write about becoming an engineer. Of course, I was in St. Peter's. You were doing all these subjects, uh, metal work and woodwork, and auto mechanics and electricity. So I said, oh, let me just decide that I would want to be an engineer. Of course, I was in the seminary. For me, it was, I thought it was just an academic exercise. Not knowing everybody else in the seminary wrote about becoming a priest, how they would want to become a priest, a good priest and things like that. But I was on the other side, <laughs> thinking that this for me, it was like an academic, academic exercise I was doing. So I wrote about becoming an engineer. It landed me into trouble because my essay was brought unbeknownst to me, to the rector. So the rector read this essay and it was like, there were doubts in his head now about me, you know? And he never told me this. He, he, he really made life difficult for me. <laughs> yeah, I didn't know why. Sometimes, you see, I didn't know what I did wrong. I tried to be happy, I tried to do things right. But, you know, in his mind, I was only there while in a time. Yes. Yes, yeah, so that's why I was, that's how I was, I was uh, taken to be somebody there while in a wait time. So my first day, I really suffered. But he didn't say anything. It was to, to, at the end of the year, you know, those days they wrote reports for us. At the end of the year, he had the courage to write and say that he wasn't sure of. I still remember that, that state. That was the first time I came across the word motivation. He said, I am not sure of his motivation of being in the seminary. That statement troubled me throughout the whole day. I, then I went away, took a dictionary. At first I didn't understand, took a dictionary and looked for the meaning of the word motivation. It was only then I started realizing, yeah, this man felt I was just here to wait, to, to keep away, to wait, to, to while away time, maybe to have a place to read and study and have some nice benachin, but <laughs> really I was in. So I went away for holidays, but coming back, I wasn't even sure whether I would be accepted back. So I didn't have a good holiday. That holiday was a terrible holiday for me, especially towards the end of the holiday. I had some nightmares. I really had in, grown in tune with the, the desire to become a priest. But I had this difficult time now, but I came back. No, I didn't come back. 
actually. I didn't come back. The first day, I didn't come back. The second day, I didn't come back. So the third day, he sent for me. Because I didn't know what my faith was. So he sent for me because the voice saw, told him they saw me in the school. So he came, I came. I came. So I came after school. I came to meet him and he asked where I was in. in. So I said, ah, I'm, not, I'm not sure whether I'm accepted because of that uh, report I got. And, uh, and then he confessed to me that it was about this essay. I said, yeah, I saw this line on my thing and you are not sure of my motivation becoming a priest. So I'm afraid if I come, you'll tell me, go away. <laughs> So he said, then he said to me, uh, this was the reason why he had said that, because I wrote this essay when everybody wrote about becoming good priest and great priest. I was looking to become, I was thinking of becoming a great engineer. <laughs> then I was relaxed. And I said to him, no, but for me, it was just an academic thing. It wasn't anything mm -hmm. about the priesthood. And, uh, so he, yeah, so we, 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 we spoke, we spoke, <laughs> we had hard talk. <laughs> And then we reconciled and he said to me, I should go and come back in the evening. So I went and came back in the evening and, and things went well. In fact, interestingly, I became the head boy in my family. <laughs> the boy who, who's, who was in show, who's, who, whom the director was in show of his motivation of becoming a priest, he made him head boy. So I was the head boy of the seminary. So it ended well. Uh, yeah, my today priest. <laughs> now I'm sure of my motivation. <laughs> God be the glory. Amen. <laughs> Let's talk about your post junior seminary. Um, that is, you went to the senior seminary. Yeah. Um, for your formation for the priesthood. Let's in. Let's get into that period. Yeah, I finished uh, secondary school in 88. 88 June. Yeah, June. June 88, and then. And then I was recommended. You had to be recommended. Not everybody went to the seminary. Junior seminary proceeded that okay. automatically. You had to be recommended. The, the, the director then had to, the, to say you were okay, suitable to move on. So I was recommended together with two of my other brothers, Father Antoine and Father Emil. We all, we all traveled to Kisito, to St. Kisito. First, it was like the pre-major. First, for our formation, you go first to the pre-major for a year. For a, for, let's say for about nine, 10 months. It was, we call it spiritual year. Mm. And then, so we spent a year that I traveled with Antoine and Father Emil joined us a, f a few months later. We traveled to Sierra Leone. It, 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 was, it was good, it was good in Sierra Leone. Mm. We went as small boys. <laughs> Young boys. <laughs> yes. <laughs> They just finished school, and in those days, we used to be small. Now, young people, when people are graduating, I see them big, almost my height. But during our time, we were small, maybe because we didn't have uh, uh, this bad food that people eat now and grow fast. <laughs> we grew naturally. So we were, we were all small, carrying our suitcase. We could, we could hardly carry our suitcase. It was interesting to know those days when we see pictures. Uh, Adi, Adi, Adi Senghor shows us some pictures when we were small boys uh, in first year, second year. We were very little and very small. Well, it was interesting. We went to the seminary. We, 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 it, the young people traveling in those days wasn't, wasn't a, a thing that was common. Yeah, common, yeah, in, in those days. But we, we went. We, 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 were, we were fortunate to travel by, the, in those days it was called British Caledonia, this, this great flight. Mm -hmm. So we moved here to Conakry and then to Sierra Leone in you know, about one hour, 30 minutes. We were there or two hours. And then we spent the night in Freetown in a place called Santana House, that's like the secretariat. And in the morning they put us in a bus. Yeah? So one of the caretakers took us to the garden and put us in a bus. I have an interesting story to tell with myself and Father Anthony, always arguing about who. <laughs> so we were in this bus, and then this was about 10, 11 o'clock. We were now moving to the pre-major. The pre-major was up country in, in a place called Kenema. Kenema would be about what, three or four hours drive from Freetown. So we were going, and then, uh, this, there was this boy who was selling uh, beer. You know, in Sierra Leone, they call, they call this ginger, ginger beer. They call it beer. So this boy was selling beer this early morning. Beer, beer, the cold one. So we didn't understand. You know, I was sitting with my brother Antoine. Antoine said, me, these people are selling beer this early morning. Tell him to come here. Let's see what type of beer it is. So I called this boy. <laughs> Later we realized it was ginger. It was in beer. So we, we always tease each other about who wanted to drink beer that morning. Was it me or was it him? Was it Father Antoine? 
and he would deny that he is the one who wanted to buy beer, even though he was the one who told me, call the boy. <laughs> <laughs> so we traveled to Kenema, and Kenema was nice. We did a lot of grass cutting, you know. In, in Sierra Leone, the, the rain comes like nobody's business, and we did a lot of work there, but we did a lot of spirituality. We learned, we learned a few things, spiritually, meditation, and all these things. It was a good year. It was a good formation, spiritual formation, that would get you ready. Because after the, that spiritual formation, it was more academic. So really, it's a good year that you, you are formed spiritually and you, you prepare yourself spiritually for the seminary. And then a year later, we moved on to, to Liberia. Liberia. But we were welcomed into Liberia by the war. At least stayed an academic year in Liberia. It was a nice seminary, fine place. Uh, great built as a seminary. So we were there for about a year and then this war started. In fact, the war started before the year. We stayed on there and then the war came. But Liberia was nice. We enjoyed the lessons, the lecturers. Uh, the formation was great. But then the war came and we have to move as refugee seminarians to Sierra Leone. Sierra Leone was a bit tough because we are like refugees there. Uh, it was tough. We, we stayed in Liberia, you had your own room as a young man. You know, we stayed maybe 10 a room, 6 a room, because we are now occupying a junior seminary. And it wasn't meant to be a, a college for people to stay in, but we had to manage there. It was a bit difficult, it was a bit tough. Uh, tough and rough. <laughs> <laughs> yes, because the facilities we are not meant for the number of students that we had there. So we were straining and we were straining the facilities. And, but then also the war came to Sierra Leone and we, we would close a few times, come home after three months, we'll go back. It was expensive for the bishop paying our tickets here and there. And uh, it was tense sometimes here in class, you hear guns, guns and we pack. We had, we had a, a, a smart rector do, very smart rector. It, it, everybody packed a bag for contingent for running yeah. <laughs> so that at least you will have some few things so everybody had a backpack and we had a, he said the bell will be wrong when we hear the bell the thing you should do is just run to pick your bag <laughs> enter the car <laughs> sometimes the car we are standing by waiting to evacuate us yeah. that, that was the kind of situation we had really it was tough sometimes in those years we went to sierra leone in 90 i think yeah it's nine, yeah, 1991, 91, I think. Yeah, 1991, yeah, or oh, 89, 90. And uh, within, within a few years, really, we would come home for three months and we'd go back and exams were tough because the every academic work was compressed because you didn't have the, the, the luxury of time again. But it was, it was also, it, it, it taught us some lessons too. <laughs> to be able to face difficult situations, uh, tense situations. So we learned that as young seminarians. From, from us, up to who? Up to Lopez. We were all in that type of situation, you know? Up to Lopez, yes. I think Lopez was the last, Lopez group, they were the last there, I think. Yeah, the others came by the time we had moved to Ghana, but we, we would go and come back. But we also had exciting things. That was the, when we were in Sierra Leone, the Pope came to visit Gambia and we were privileged to be, to be ferried back home, to come for, for that visit. That, that, was the, that was the high point of our, our seminary days. We were not sure, but we had a nice bishop. So what we did was we decided we would write a letter and ask, and uh, we were just gambling. Mm. <laughs> but we were, we, were, we were really surprised that he, he agreed to pay our tickets. You know? So he paid for all of us, except those who were we, who were in the other seminary? They, they had just come, you know. You know, for for that that time, for the spiritually, they used to start in December, and the Pope came in February. So they had just come, and this thing was happening. So the bishop said, ah, "You are still small boys. You can stay." <laughs> I think it was a group of Lopez. When we came, it was it was really the high point of our seminary days. But some of these two were nice. We played, we played football and we did all, sang great songs. I enjoyed uh, a life in the seminary, except for those war years when you had to run. Sometimes when we were running, luckily when, when I was small. So when we were running, you know, 
the, the, the rebels had bypassed the place. So we were going to pass through rebel zones, go to Freetown. I was lucky, I sat, I sat in between two fat priests with big stomachs. So I, I said to myself in the car, the bullet will stop in their stomachs. <laughs> <laughs> so I was safe. It was not bad sometimes uh, when you are running away from the place. So, but the last time he ran away, that was January 95. In fact, when, when we were going around November 95, we went back. But some of our parents or some people had complained to the bishop that it wasn't safe and it wasn't good to be going and coming like that. But he had promised us that, that November. As we were going, he came to see us off and he, he had promised us that if we came back home, that will be the end of Sierra Leone. Mm -hmm. So in January, it was really, really bad. It was really, really tense in Sierra Leone. They had even overtaken the barracks in the town that we are in, uh, McKinney. So when we came back, even to come get a plane to come home was tough. So we, we had just finished our pastoral year here then. That time you were almost a baby. <laughs> I was in the cathedral during my pastoral year. We had just finished our pastoral year. That is Father Antoine, Father Emil, and myself. And we, we, when we were going, we had an, our passport had expired. You know, passport five years. We did one year spiritual year, four years for our first degree, so five years. So when we came back home, our ex passports had expired. This was 94. You know, 94 with the coup d'etat of your Jame, passports were nowhere to be found. So we couldn't go on time. We had to stay here for a while. The seminarians went back in September. We only went back in October. So we, we, we went with a different flight that time. So coming back home, our flight had stopped coming. So I, our tickets were obsolete, the three of us. We stayed back in Sierra Leone for almost a month. <laughs> the, the rest had gone home with their flight. Their flight was still flying. Our flight was in, so we were waiting to get any flight that would come. Yes. So we stayed back there in Freetown. The others had gone. Freetown was still calm, but everybody was, came to Freetown. It was like the, the safe haven at the time. We were there for a while. We also enjoyed because the rector gave us a lot of money, all the leos that was left. Because when we were going, we didn't think about even the fact that the seminary was going to reopen. So we stayed there for a while. So by the time we arrived here in the Gambia, the bishop had decided that the orders would all go to Ghana. So by the time we arrived here, the orders went to Ghana. They had already gone because we were still there stranded. So uh, then we joined them later in Ghana. But Ghana was nice. When we reached Ghana, it was really nice. We enjoyed ourselves. It was a normal seminary. You had your room, you had your peace. Everything was okay. It was like Liberia. And, uh, and uh, the only thing at the beginning, we, we, learned to, we learned to eat the food, you know. You know when you go to a new culture, sometimes the food is a bit uh, different. We complain about the food. But today, I even prefer Ghanaian food to Ghanaian food. <laughs> but at that time, we complained, we wrote letters to say, ah, the food is a bit tough to take at the beginning. Yeah, but for everybody, any new place, it's like that. So, but, but we enjoyed our time in Ghana. We, we, we stayed two and a half years. We, we were almost towards the end of our time when we left Sierra Leone. We stayed two and a half years. Some people stayed shorter, like Father Pascal stayed a shorter time there. But it was good. I, I enjoyed it more than Liberia and Sierra Leone. I enjoyed Ghana more. So it was nice. We had a foster father there. The Bishop of Kumasi was our, our grandfather there. Bishop Clary handed him over to us. So we went there for holiday, for breaks. And, uh, and uh, the Ghanaians were very welcoming and happy people. And uh, it, was, it was great in Ghana. For and one of my safe pick, pick friends there, some Lebanese friends, and they spoiled us, the New Year Hall. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they really looked after us. We met them at an ordination ceremony. I'm going to Manak and we like exploring things. <laughs> <laughs> Some of the guys in the for G2. Mm -hmm. Then there was this seminary, that there was this ordination of five bishops one day in Accra. But I think the other seminarians had a culture shock. <laughs> they were still moaning about Ghana. We arrived and it was said, those who wanted to go should join the bus. Manak and we jumped into the bus. We were, we, were, we were barely two years old in the seminary. We jumped into that bus. We went for that ordination. We were dancing away. But we couldn't sing the songs. These Lebanese people found us very strange. Every seminary was singing and dancing, but we couldn't sing. And they started talking to us. In Ghana, ceremonies like that would last six hours. We were, we were at that ceremony from 10 o'clock to 6 o'clock. Eight hours. <laughs> 
eight hours. So that's why we pick up those friends. And, and later on, they made us happy. Same so I, I enjoyed my time in Ghana. It was a blessing to have gone there. We went in difficult circumstances, but God knows how to make a way. Hmm? These days we read in the scriptures that he makes, he makes a way in the desert. He makes, uh, he makes vegetation in the wilderness. So it was nice. I had a good time as a seminarian. I enjoyed my, my formative years really as a seminarian. Of course, tough days, difficult circumstances sometimes. That is life. <laughs> the priesthood is a tough thing too, it tough is. profession. So to have a, formation, a tough formation like that, it's also good. God's blessing. God's blessing. The journey mm. was challenging, but mm. to God be the glory. Amen. Um, but it's unusual for some parents to, to, to slightly resist. Let's, let's go back to that day when you sat your parents down and said, this is it, I have been called to serve God. What was that moment like? Because you've already said it was hard in the beginning. It's usually hard for parents to accept mm -hmm. that their, ch their child has decided to move away from his comfort zone to join the seminary. What was it like at that moment? Yeah, at the beginning, like I said, at the beginning, uh, my, my mom Things had some initial my elder siblings. My my brother was very supportive. My brother was my elder brother, the, my, the firstborn of my family. My mother, he wasn't there when I when I was going to the seminary. He he, he was raised in Senegal, raised up in Senegal. But when he came, the first time he came back home for holiday, and had that very support. He was, I, I say I. I I said to him, you don't know what happened before you came. <laughs> yeah, but, uh, but yeah, my, my, some of my siblings, the, the older ones, were a bit apprehensive about my going to the seminary. But, but since my mom had said yes uh, to Father Konati, she didn't look back. You know, she just allowed me. Maybe she thought it will come to pass. You will come back home at some stage. When it came to ordination, I just informed her that this is the date. I didn't have to negotiate again. But because gradually, almost everybody accepted it. Accepted that I was going to become a priest because there was no turning back. Even though, even those years when we were going and coming, and uh, at some stage, my mother felt, was it safe? So I didn't discuss that thing that was happening. It was like I came home for holiday. With my brothers, they knew that it was difficult in Sierra Leone, my other siblings. But my mother didn't understand what was happening. You know, sometimes we go, we go to the seminary two months, we come back. Mm. Really, it was, I, I, it was expensive for the diocese, think those tickets. Yeah, that was it. But when, when towards the end, it was like, it was great. Uh, and even all those who didn't, who, who I had an aunt, my, 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 my dad's first cousin. She opposed it to the end, but on the day of ordination, she was dancing more than anybody else. The Spirit of God had done her work in the meantime. <laughs> yes. So uh, my, my, my father's immediate younger sister, she's called uh, Christine Tupan. She too wasn't very interested. She felt like my, my dad didn't have many uh, male children. You know, you know, these people, it's all about uh, life. Is it's all about procreation. And uh, uh, for her, uh, uh, for her and my, 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 my dad, they are the only two. So she felt like, yo, we are only two, me and your dad. Now, look at you, want to become. <laughs> yeah, but thank God that uh, later on she came when they celebrated my ordination. It was nice. So really, my family, my family ultimately accepted the will of God and accepted that I should be a priest. I'm called to the priesthood and uh, 
and they have been supportive since then. None of them ever looked back, really. From the moment uh, I was ordained, uh, I was given first position, really, in the family. The other day I said it, uh, uh, and my, my mother didn't live long after my ordination, but really she appreciated me uh, being ordained. I told my, my siblings already, please don't be jealous that I'm saying this. <laughs> But I, I just had the feeling that uh, I was the most appreciated by my mom, even as she was dying. Mm -hmm. So sometimes people feel the priesthood is a waste, it's a lost. Today, we have some ladies here, you know, we have this lake of hosting the delegates, some ladies from NBD. We had a nice chat there, and later on, as I was coming back home, they said to me, uh, where is your wife? First, they said, do you live here? I said, yes. Yeah, are you the principal of the school? Yes. So where is your wife? And I said to them, I don't have a wife. You don't have a wife? <laughs> <laughs> yes, I said, I'm a priest. Priests don't have wives. <laughs> it was like a big thing. I said, I said to them, in two days, we'll have a celebration here for my 25th anniversary as a priest. I've been a priest for 25 years. <laughs> and I said, some people are 40 years. Some people go for 50 years, they don't have a wife, and they don't die. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> interesting, Father Bruno. Mm -hmm. I must admit, the story, um, mm -hmm. the story is quite interesting. Yeah. Um, even though um, going through the junior and senior seminary has been tough and challenging, but um, God has been good. And um, just like we always say, to God be the glory. Mm -hmm. um, that day, it was the four of you, and uh, take us through from the moment you woke up to the special moment when the deacon stool was removed and you were finally vested. What was that special moment like? Yeah, this is the special moment, like you are saying, began a year before when we were within deacons. We were ordained deacons in Ghana, the three of us. Uh, I, I know Bishop Gabriel, he was ordained a deacon in, in Nigeria where he was studying. We were ordained deacons in Ghana by Bishop Sapo. It was, we, 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 we felt like, ah, we were being ordained outside our country, but Bishop Sapo made us feel at home. He had, okay, we were ordained together with his own candidates. He, he, we also had, uh, I think, three candidates from the Diocese of Kumasi. Kumasi has since become an archdiocese. When we were ordained, it was uh, a suffragan of uh, the Diocese of Accra. We were ordained together with those three. I think there were three, yes, three others. So we were six ordained as deacons. You know, that's why it begins. You're, you're ordained for us as a deacon. But it was a very happy moment for us. For me, it was really a moment that I look forward to and I, and, 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 and I, I prepared spiritually for that day. Uh, when we were being ordained, it, 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 it almost rained. The clouds were dark, and I prayed, <laughs> and I prayed, and I and I asked God to stop that rain, and 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 you see, it was a spiritual experience I got at my at my ordination. I was just wondering because it was we were ordained outside, just like we have ordinations here. In many places, the, the, the diaconate ordination is made a little bit smaller in churches, but Bishop Sapo made it big. It was like he was also with proud to be ordaining people of other countries, people of uh, people of other dioceses. So it was outside. And we and, and that and that, when I prayed and it didn't rain, you know, it was like, yeah, God is great. God is wonderful. And that God has been wonderful. That day I praised God in my heart that, that it didn't rain. I was really in tune with the Spirit of God. I was really a happy man. And I blessed God that that rain did not come, and we had a wonderful uh, ordination ceremony. And 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 our priestly ordination was also something similar. We were four, we were three, and then and then and then uh, uh, Gabriel had already finished his studies. So and uh, his congregation wanted us to be together. So we were four. It was it was a blessing. Before now, the diocese had not even ordained three. We jumped from two to four. It was first ordained one, one, then we had two people ordained. We, we, no, two were not. Yeah, two were ordained first. The first two, that's first Father Peter and Father Gabriel, they were ordained together uh, on the same day. And there were no three ordinations. We were going to be three. And then Bishop Gabriel came to join us and we became four. It became mighty. 
and we are still holding the record. <laughs> <Amen>. <laughs> and if nothing ha miraculous happens, we, we will still be holding on to it mm -hmm. for a few more years. Maybe something will happen, you never know. <laughs> but it was a blessing that uh, four of us were ordained. It was exuberant because he had priorities of all of us gathered together. Guinea Bissau, Senegal, Sierra Leone, because some of the Nigeria, because some of the Holy Ghost fathers came because of their first spirit and priest in the Gambia. It was wonderful. Our people came, my relatives came from all over Guinea Bissau, Senegal, Casamas, Dakar, Gambia. It was, it was super. It was wonderful. But God was great that uh, we were ordained by Bishop El Clary very humble man, very nice bishop who looked after us at the beginning. And he will always show us to the people and say, these are your priests, look after them. I still remember that. It was a blessing. It was a, a, a wonderful day. For, for me, those moments really taught me spiritually. They taught me spiritually. So I always thank God for those moments of retreat. We usually have an eight day retreat preparing for that day. That did it, they, those two days of the day of my diaconal ordination and day of my priestly ordination, I was, I was really spiritually taught. I was in tune with the Spirit of God. And that, that, that gives happiness. That gives me happiness up to today. It carries me along. Those type of uh, situations will carry you along. So my, my diaconal ordination, the spiritual experience I had that day, my, 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 my priestly ordination, the spiritual experience that I had that day, those experiences carry me along each day. Even when life is sometimes tough and wearisome, and you go back to those days, you always say, yes, it's okay. <laughs> I thank God. I will go on. I will move on. Indeed. Yeah. Let's talk about your post-ordination. Um, take us through your journey to this very moment where or we have you multitasking, mm -hmm. being a parish priest and a principal of St. Augustine's, and also um, doing a part-time lecturing at the UTG. How does it feel like? Good. I think I was introduced to this by Bishop Clary, this multitasking, right at the beginning. You know, uh, before our ordinations, we all went individually to see him. Uh, a few days before our ordinations, he, he invited us to go and see him. When I, when I came back, when we came back finally, having finished my formative years at the seminary, I came as a deacon, of course. In those days we served as a deacon for one year. We were ordained and we came on holiday. We did pastoral work. I did my pastoral work as a de deacon in Basse. Father Peter liked me. He always asked me to go wherever he went. He, he would suggest that I go. So I was there for a month or so, came back, and then went back to the seminary. When I came back, I was assigned there too. So I did my diaconate pastorals in Basse with Father Peter. So I was there from August, came back in June, Ju in July, after the holiday. I was there from August to November. On, no, I was there from August to October, end of October. And then we went to, we went to the, we went for a retreat. And I think just before we left for the retreat or after the retreat, before the ordination anyway, he called us individually to tell us about our appointment. And so I went in there. We all went in there. I think Antoine went first. He, he was reassigned where he was in Farafene. And Father Emil went, he was reassigned where he was in Katong. So when I was going, I thought I was going to be reassigned to Basse. But then I was already given multitask right at the beginning. So he, he read my appointment letter to me that I was going to be assistant at the cathedral, that I was going to teach at St. Augustine's, that I was going to work at GPI. <laughs> so you see how it started. <laughs> so I used to have that uh, triangle as a young man, young priest. So I would get up at the cathedral in the morning, I either come to the school, then go to GPI later, or depending on my timetable here and my timetable at the GPI. At the GPI, I was in charge of religious education. I was in charge of uh, secondary religious education at the secondary level. We had coordinators. Uh, mm, uh, some, some, somebody was in charge of primary schools, and I was in charge of secondary schools. So I did a lot, of, a lot of trekking. And a few weeks later, I was made youth chaplain. Imagine wow. adding to all that. 
And uh, after a few weeks, I was made coordinator of missionary childhood. I did a few things. Maybe I was the small boy around the place. Mm -hmm. so all these small, small jobs, all the other priests were, all the Gambian priests were in parishes. So I was doing, so I got used to that. As a young priest, I was, I was doing trekking for youth ministry all over the parishes. But I was also a GPI, also trekking schools. So but it was good for me. I liked it. <laughs> it kept me busy. But I was happy doing it. And I didn't teach much though. Uh, because the principal too was told that I was doing other things. Father Bishop Clary, practical to Charles, it was Charles Mendy at the time. He's also doing these things. So I, I, I was almost like a part-time here, teacher here. But I did a few things here and there. And, uh, and, and working at the GP, I used to represent Father Ellison at the time, who, was, who had since become the director of GPI. I used to, he didn't like going to meetings. I like traveling. <laughs> <laughs> so it was like, Bruno go to Sierra Leone for this meeting. Bruno go to, uh, it was, in, I, I didn't even say no, or I was tired. <laughs> I, I went to all these meetings. So it introduced me to traveling and, and later on, I got a job there at, at the level of West Africa. I became coordinator of um, biblical apostolate in West Africa. And I became executive secretary of AWAC, Anglophone, Anglophone West African Catechetical Commission. So I did those type of jobs and they took me all over the world. I went for meetings and I went for workshops and things like that. So I'm, I've been used to multitasking ages ago. priest there for 15 months. It was great. But I was also in an acting capacity. Now I'm a parish priest, <laughs> even though it's a small parish, but I, I enjoy it. And uh, it, it, it gives a balance, like um, the priest to do something pastoral. You know, when you are into schooling, it's more social and things like that. But uh, there's a little bit of pastoral in, in school, but it's not full-time pastoral work. So it's like full-time social work, secular work. But I'm happy to do all, and it keeps me going. It keeps yeah. you going, yeah. indeed. Mm -hmm. So just like you mentioned, uh, so in a nutshell, it's 25 years of hard work, mm -hmm. commitment, and dedication, because you have mentioned that you are the Executive Secretary and Finance Administrator of the Regional Union of Priests of West Africa. Yeah, that's, that's, that, that, that's a job that I do now. That, that is the job that you do now. Yes. Uh, 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 aside these things that I do in the Gambia here, so I work, you know, we have, we have a union of priests. We try to bring all the Catholic priests of West Africa together, Anglophone, Lusophone, and Francophone. So we, 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 we have that together. We, we have meetings and workshops once a year. So I have to organize those as, secretary, as executive secretary. So that's why I travel quite a lot to these, some of these West African countries. And I'm also in charge of the finance of the, 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 the fathers. <laughs> but you see, one job leads to another. As principal, you, you look after finance of school. So uh, that has given me already the, 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 the experience. So it's not tough to, to be like, to look after money and to, to look mm -hmm. after the finance. Plenty of money do, but uh, I know how to do the work. <laughs> so I do it, I do it uh, also, that, that's one of the things I do part time. I do a few things part time, but uh, I enjoy doing it, and uh, and some of the fathers like me doing it. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed, yeah. You had mentioned that you loved um, traveling, mm -hmm. and uh, sometimes, I mean, you've been referred to as the parish priest of the the diaspora <laughs> by so many people, and I think during the sanctuary we saw you in 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 UK Birmingham, yeah. um, officiating um, the the mass. How do you feel, um, you know, working or being called the priest of the diaspora? Because it's it's one thing to serve God, but it's mm -hmm. another thing also to serve people. Yeah, I feel good. I, I, I'm happy to do it. I know people tease me. I know <laughs> somebody who teases me about these things, Uncle Tony, Uncle Tony <laughs> Carvalho, when for the diaspora. Yeah, but maybe it came about because of um, during 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 the during the pandemic. I just felt that like 
like uh, we can do some outreach. The first time I celebrated Mass, the first Sunday I celebrated Mass alone in the church. I went to the church just after the declaration of the bishop that we should stop having public events. So I went to, the, to, to my chapel. I have a chapel in my house here. I celebrated Mass. I felt, I remember I had a good liturgist who taught me liturgy. And, uh, and he said, it, it, Mass shouldn't be celebrated by one person. Because even the wording of the mass, the Lord be with you. He said, if you celebrate mass alone, when you say the Lord be with you, who responds? So that's what it felt like. Ah, I was missing my people. So I decided to do some recording. So I recorded some prayer. I recorded some the gospel of the day, and I did a little, a little sermon and I shared about with my community since I cannot go for mass. Then I went to, I think it was on Easter Sunday, I went to my brother's house and I met Dr. Jabang. Uh, Dr. Jabang, John Jabang, Dr. Jabang said, Father, how are you managing now? How do you, how are you managing to reach to your people? And I, and I said to him, what I do is I record some message on a Sunday night and I shared. And he said, you know, in my church, what we are doing, we are using Zoom now. So he introduced me to Zoom. And we had a chat about or Zoom, and I, I, I was just wondering what this Zoom is all, all about. Well, you know, I have an exploring mind. So I came back home, I went on YouTube, and I explored Zoom. And I put up, I said, yeah, this is interesting. So I put up a notice on my judges, my parish WhatsApp group. And I said to them, I would like anybody who is interested to download Zoom and register for Zoom, and then we can have mass on Zoom. That's how we started. Some, some people went into people like, people like Richie, people, a good number of people in the parish decided to exploit. Richie and wife were the first, a few people. And then we started celebrating mass on Zoom. And it was a bit difficult at the beginning. We didn't understand it. And gradually we became masters of it. And then, and then we opened it to everybody. And people in the diaspora liked it because they, it was worst. The coronavirus was worst in their countries. Sometimes you, you had mass and you had 100 people logged in, 200 people sometimes, especially at the peak of the, uh, the, peak of the coronavirus and people, some people sponsored, you know, Zoom, you had to pay some people like Adelaide and uh, Josephine Ellis, they, they, they sponsored it and we, we were having it and it was nice and that's how we, we, people, people zoomed in, <laughs> into the Zoom and we prayed and, 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 and and we started, then we started having personal contact with people. And we started doing other ministries together with Christian Panorama. Of course, they are the leader in this business of, of, of uh, using the social media to evangelize. That's how I got connected, hooked up with so many people in diaspora, <laughs> so that now they call me the Paris Prince of the Diaspora. And it was nice. Over the summer, they invited me. I, over the summer, I was, I was actually going to go to Germany. I wanted to go to Germany for for holiday, I had planned to visit my friend in Brazil, uh, a priest friend that I met many years ago, actually not many years ago, 25 years ago. Wow. I met this priest through the mother uh, 25 years ago, just shortly after, a few weeks after my ordination, we became great friends. So I was going to visit him in, in Brazil this year. It's a jubilee year, so we had planned that we would meet in Brazil. He was, he's, he's now a semi-religious priest. You know? I don't want to go into detail about what it means. <laughs> so he, he works with a, 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 some sort of a, con a new congregation, and he was posted there. So just when we were about to do the, he moved off to Germany. So I was going to see him. And then they, 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 they asked me for, like, they wanted a Gambian priest, you know. Uh, luckily, I already have a long, have a long time visa. So I, that's why I was able to go. Some, they, also, they even wanted Father John to come across, but he wasn't able to get the visa. We would have been there with him. But since I had a visa, I said yes. So I was happy to go. <laughs> it was a nice celebration. I didn't regret having changed my mind from going to Germany to going to England. So I went. It was nice. It was a great celebration. It was their silver, silver jubilee too. So my silver jubilee. So it was good to go yeah. uh, and, and start the preamble of my silver jubilee with them. And, and they were really good. I was invited by the community of... Uh, the Christian community of Birmingham. And, and, and they really filled my pocket by the time I came back home. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> yes, yeah, so I was happy to have gone, but the celebration was exuberant. It was nice. It was a great celebration they had there. 
last 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 August. Mm. So I enjoyed myself, but I think they also enjoyed the, 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 the thing there. But uh, I'm happy to be in touch with the people in the diaspora. Indeed. They are our brothers, and they support our church quite a lot, especially during the during the the coronavirus months. For for my church, really, we got a, we got a lot of support from from the diaspora, from my parish. Mm -hmm. Indeed, I wanted to ask um, you your experience working with the diaspora, just like you have mentioned. Because during COVID-19, I mean, churches were closed. People did not have the opportunity to worship. And um, the masses online through social media was able to draw people closer mm -hmm. to Christ. And then it paved the way. And also it spiritually helped so many people because um, people were able to um, have the mass life in the comfort of their homes, mm -hmm. some even at workplaces. Um, what good experience do you have working with the diaspora? I, I, I connected, we connected, of course, even when we went back to church, we had this mass via Zoom. I, had, I sat there in my chapel and we prayed and we connected. We connected with people. Father Yenes and Father John were in Rome and they would join us. Sometimes I would celebrate mass and Father Yenes would preach or Father John would preach. It was possible to do a lot of things. I actually... The first time I explored this possibility, I saw that the Pope did that himself. The first rosary that the Pope had during the coronavirus, someone was in Africa here, did a decade. Somebody in Europe did another decade. Somebody in, in Asia did another decade. Somebody in, in Australia did another decade. Somebody in America did another decade. I was, I was moved. I sat here, I casted the, the, the the prayer evening, I'm sure everybody, it was announced, the prayer evening on my screen and I watched it, I was really moved. I said, so these things are possible. We, we tried to do that exactly. So that's, why, that's why we were able to connect. When we went back to church, we could do the Zoom. So uh, I trained people, the, the cameraman there is one of those, we really, I really trained people to, to be able to do it so that we can continue. Because first, our church is closed here. We were having Zoom. Then the bishop opened the churches. We stopped. Then after a few months, churches closed again and we started. And when we started, we got more people from the diaspora. And the last day we were announcing that next week we are going back to church, Martha now, God bless her soul. Martha now said to me, but it was nice the way we had these Zoom masses. We would start maybe some 30 minutes before we'll have a chat. I just said, to, we just started saying hi, hello. That's why we got to know each other. Really, we just had a chat because I felt we should know each other. So we will have a chat. Mass was at 10. We will start, I will go online at half past. So people will come in and we'll, we'll talk about Nato Fufu, Nato Angelte, Nato America, Nato Gambia. At 10 o'clock, we had a mass. Maybe at 11, 11 30, we finished. I left it open there. People were chatting away. We chatted. So we got to know each other. So when we were going back to church, Martha said, Father, so that's why we hooked up. We try to understand the Zoom better. The internet sometimes would be our problem. And then we hooked up. We just continued. We were having our live mass, but we were hooking them there in, on the Zoom. They were, they were, they were fooling these masses through the Zoom. And it was really, really a blessing. And we had people, I had somebody from Qatar, from Saudi Arabia. He didn't even know. They were following it because I used to put it also on, on Facebook. Some of them were following it on Facebook. This boy called Sangmen, he used to be my student here in St. Augustine's in my early years here. Sangmen said, Father, even without Zoom, I never had mass. Even, sorry, without Corona. Before Corona, I never had mass. This is a blessing. And some once in a while, will send us a thousand dollars. I said, this is my offering. They were sending offering here. Even though we were, they were on the Zoom, they were sending offering to our church. Once in a while, somebody will send offering uh, to our church. We, we survived as a church here in this parish, small as we are, $3,000 every, every Sunday will not make us survive here. Okay. But really during those uh, corona years, 2020, 21, up to now, we still have people who support us, especially for our parish fees in the diaspora. We, we were blessed with that. Mm -hmm. But we, we got that blessing through our, our ministry, our outreach through these uh, 
uh, information superhighway, we were reaching out to people. We reached out to people who were quietly in their corners, who were not in touch with the mass, and they came back to the mass. We, right now, I have a lady. Some people just are still hooked up with us. I have a lady in the hospital who, who hooks up with us every Sunday for mass. I have another lady. Uh, now, uh, she, she, once in a while, she will send about $25 to Harriet. Harriet, Harriet Carvalho. Harriet Carvalho is our treasurer there. Mm -hmm. And uh, Harriet Carvalho says, one of your friends. I said, no, that is offering. <laughs> the last time, somebody, your friend? I said, no, that is offering. Somebody is sending a uh, Sunday offering to you. Uh, but people really, we, we still, we're still in touch with certain people. People are still hooked up with us and they follow our mass because they cannot go to, they cannot go to church because they are aged. They, are, they have ill Somebody is on a wheelchair every Sunday, uh, but she still attends our mass via Zoom. So that is outreach, really. So I'm happy to be the parish priest of the diaspora. <laughs> Indeed, you are happy <laughs> yes. to be the, the parish priest. Yeah, because there's that outreach, and that is, that is our job as Indeed. priest, to reach out to people with the word of God, uh, to minister to God's uh, children here on earth. Indeed. Thank you very much, Father Bruno. Um, before I'm coming back with some just few corrections, um, we will take a quick break and then we will come back and just ask some few corrections. And then it's a bye from Christian Panorama, Wow um, Kerchenda. If you're just joining us today, we're here in Banjul. Uh, I am your host, Anna Marie Prom, and with me, Father Bruno Tupan. Uh, we're celebrating 25 years of hard work commitment and dedication uh, to God and also to humanity because um, we serve God and we also serve the people of God. We want to congratulate Father Bruno Tupan on this anniversary and we pray that the Lord will continue to be with you and guide you and that he will continue to pave a way where there seems to be in no way. Amen. Amen. So we will come back um, very soon, viewers. At Solen Solen Nyoto Parakte Christian Panorama Wow Kerchenda Nyo Nyo Fi Mansen Harit Senda Ka Ana Mari Prom Anda Ak Fada Bruno Tupan Momi Nga Hamne Munge Celebrate um, Silver Jubilee Bi Nga Hamne 25 years Bim Neke Si Pris Khud Bi Dilige Ilige Yala Dilige Yala The Diocese of Banju and also the legal, um, the people in the diocese of Banjo, coming over here, wondering you about um, his journey as a priest, um, the challenges they had, the difficult moments that they had, um, the tough and trial challenges that they have faced in this journey um, of being a priest. But when we come back, we'll just take a short, come a short break. When we come back, we will ask him some few more questions. And also, um, um, he's going to tell us um, how he's impacted other people in the seminary and helped or assisted people to become what they are today. Because I'm sure that he has touched so many young people in the diocese of man. He has um, impacted so many lives. So when you come back, um, do, don't go away. Stay with Christian Panorama or Christian Lara.
Yes, yeah, so I, like I said, uh, he, he told me around February that he wanted me to move. Yeah, I said, okay, no problem. So I knew a few months away from, from September that I was going to move here. And, uh, but he couldn't come to see what was happening here. So he looked at it as a spy. So surprisingly, I, accept, I accepted it right there, there, there and then. He still wanted to be, he said, go, go and think, go and think about it. Are you sure? Go and think about it. So a few months later, they asked me, I said, yes, I'm still, I'm going. So September, I came here, but I committed this new job to God, just like I did at the beginning, you know, when I went into St. Peter's, or when I went into every job, you know, because it's, it's God. For me, I believe that when we commit things to God, God makes a way, you know, he makes a way. It was tough at the beginning, uh, but I knew I have committed my course to God. Mm -hmm. That's what the psalmist says, I have committed my course to you. So I knew I had committed it to God. It was a bit difficult, it was a bit rough. I had the position, I had, I had, I had people here who were stuck on their old ways and they wouldn't change. And so uh, they even when people even when some staff even went to the, the internet trying to smear my name, thinking that they can break me. So, you cannot break somebody who has committed things to God. So, right at the beginning, uh, I met angels. <laughs> and you see, God has always put angels on my way. Uh, that's why I say, that's why I always commit things to God. Because God will always put angels on my way. And when I moved into St. Augustine's, uh, Somebody, okay, I, I, I also do a little bit of social work in my life too. I do social work. I represent them sitting foundations here and I work and I support their work here in Uganda. And I do, I represent them here to do a few things. So a particular uh, group of people wanted to, to meet me because they had heard about my, my, me from their friends in, in, in Europe and Holland. And so they wanted to meet me because I needed some technical help vis-a-vis -vis their, their work in the country. They were trying to build a school 
they were trying to do a few things in Uganda, so they needed technical advice. So God just sent them to me. I just got sad one day I got an email. I just moved in here trying to see how best to restructure, how best to rebuild the waning infrastructure of the school. And then these people appeared like angels. They were looking for some support. So I gave them the support they needed. I did the thing they wanted to do. I showed them with doors to knock and things like that. So at the end of the day, I brought them here to show them the school. They wanted to build a school, but the land was small. I said, okay, you can build stories instead of having, they wanted to build the type of thing, buildings that we had in St. Peter's. But I said, you can build stories. And I said, let me take you to where I am now so that they can have that idea. So I told them, you can build, we have two stories, but you can have three stories or four stories, you will still work. And so, uh, so at the end of the day, they looked at the school and said, dear school is bad. They said, we cannot help you, but we will connect you. So they connected me. And, they, and I was properly connected. And these people are connected to me are now doing great work in, in this country because I also connected them to, to the Ministry of Education and they're doing great work here today. And they helped us to, to refurbish the school, to make it new as it is. Like I said, angels will always come my way. Uh, and that, that is one blessing I thank God for always, that uh, the, 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 the right people, I always meet the right people, God always puts the right people uh, in my, on my path so that they, they support that which I'm doing. So that's why I never fear. <laughs> Whatever, if you would tell me you are calling me to a hole, I'll go to that hole, mm -hmm. I'll transform that hole <laughs> to a paradise because I know God is faithful. Amen. God is faithful. That's why uh, at my 10th anniversary, at my 10th anniversary, I changed my motto. You know, every priest has a motto. My motto used to be, uh, your grace is enough for me, from Corinthians. Then at my 10th anniversary, I said, God has been so faithful. God has been so good to me. I changed, I said, now my, my motto is, Lord is my shepherd. There is nothing I shall want. Because I know always he brings me the angels who take me through troubled waters and save me and make a way for me. So I said my motto from my 10th anniversary. Actually, I, I was privileged that 10th anniversary. I was privileged to, to be invited to Rome on pilgrimage. And I went to Rome on pilgrimage. So interestingly, the, 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 there was a party there for me by the Senegalese. <laughs> and, uh, and, and, and those group of people who invited me arranged that I would celebrate Mass at the tomb of St. Peter. Not many people had that privilege. Even some priests don't have that privilege. Mm -hmm. So I was privileged on that day, 15th uh, of November 2007, when I was 10. That very day met me in Rome. And that made very day, at 12 midday, I was celebrating Mass at the tomb of Peter, at the Basilica of St. Paul, at St. Peter, right at the catacombs down. I was there celebrating Mass. I couldn't believe what was <laughs> happening. So that day, after communion, as I sat, the words came to my heart The Lord is your shepherd, no, no. There is nothing you shall want. If you have things like that, what else do you want? Nothing. The next thing is heaven. <laughs> That's the only thing you can cry for. So, yeah. so I, I decided that I would now have the Lord as my shepherd as my motto. Even though I have since changed yeah. from the 25th, from the 15th of November 2022, 25 years, I've changed. I announced it on Saturday, my new motto. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so shall it be for you. I don't know if you were, some people call you Father Recruiter, others will say Father Innovator. First recruiter, you have recruited quite a few young men that today are priests. Just how do you feel when you sit there on the ordination day and hear the words that I would like to thank Father Bruno to her? Yeah, maybe, maybe, maybe recruiter is the wrong word. Maybe, we, maybe I inspire. I would rather say maybe I inspire them. Boy, you see, I'm a teacher. I work in school, I work with students, and uh, you can be an inspiration to some of them. Um, 
And then when they come closer, there's a time you start counseling them and helping them and supporting them in their way, in the, on the way, in the way to the religious life or to the priesthood. And, uh, and like I said, you see, for me, I was misunderstood right at the beginning, I told you earlier. And uh, these young people too, we have to, sometimes we misunderstand them, sometimes we misjudge them. Uh, I, I tend to want to support them. I want to help them. Uh, that's why sometimes they will come close to you because they see that uh, you, are, you have interest in them. Uh, so they come close. So uh, I, 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 I know it's our responsibility as priests to, to encourage young people to, to, be, to be priesthood. So when somebody has an interest and confides in you, the ultimate is to help, to support. Uh, to support them spiritually, to guide them, to show them the way to go. And, uh, and maybe because of my teaching skills, <laughs> I know how to do it. And, uh, and when, you, when you help somebody, except if the person is ungrateful, but when you help somebody, they appreciate what you have done for them. Mm -hmm. They appreciate you caring about them and talking to them and, uh, and uh, yeah, helping them to journey along and, and to tell them the truth. Me, I like to tell you the truth. Mm -hmm. I don't, I don't, I don't deceive. When, when, when things are not well, I tell you. But, you know, this, this road you are trying to take is not the best one. Uh, I will, I will, I will say I don't keep it to my heart and uh, and begin to judge you wrong. You know, I call you and say this is what I'm seeing or this is what I'm hearing. I had some Indians who called me before and said they were coming home. I insulted them. <laughs> <laughs> I insulted them. So don't be foolish. Don't be stupid. I said to them, what do you mean? One of them was very sickly, and I, and I told my story. I told him my story. I was I, I didn't mention that I was very sickly in the seminary. Mm -hmm. I was also very sickly in, in the seminary. But for, for me, I felt, you know, uh, being a science student, I knew the food was making me sick. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yes, because I ate everything. For me. As a young man, I ate everything. We, we, we were taught that way, that you couldn't choose. At home, we didn't choose. We ate everything. So I ate everything. At some stage, really, I felt, I like food. I like variety of food. I knew I would be okay when I go home. Mm -hmm. <laughs> For example, when we went to Ghana, Ghana, really, I was half of the time sick. I didn't mention it earlier. And Antoine used to be my boss. <laughs> You know, we're very, we're very close. I, I played football. I played, I was very sportive in the seminary. I played football, I played basketball, I played volleyball, I played tennis, I played everything. Very well. Not, not only playing for play sake. So I was actually in the school team for all these things. And we, we used to have in the seminary games. I did play one. I was always sick. <laughs> when, when it was time to play, I would train and I would be the team captain. And, but I was very sick, so I was always sick, maybe after eating all this Christmas food. You know, we had this thing in February, these tournaments were held in February every year. I never attended, I was sick and fun. And fun. We would not go for holidays, we would stay there. We had semester breaks, we had holidays in February. After the first semester exam, there was a break, and that was the time we had these interseminary games. You know, we had competitions. I would train, maybe Christmas food would make me sick. So when, when I came home, maybe the grace of ordination healed me. <laughs> yes, this sickly man who was very sickly in the seminary. Yeah, I am perfectly well now. <laughs> 25 years, the only thing I suffer is malaria when I come to Banjul. <laughs> That's why you see my house has nets all over the place. Because I know that the only problem I have is malaria sickness. The day malaria is thing. So what really so when this military was coming home he was sick as a head, stop it, stop fooling around. So I told him the truth. So they, they I have a few priests like who are much older than them, but they're dear to my heart and I'm also dear to their hearts. Sometimes, you know, some people even feel jealous and they think I'm trying, they, sometimes I'm accused of having a click. I don't have a click. I have genuine friends. Because they saw me, they saw good in me, and I see good in them. And uh, 
and now you uh, and that is life you know when whatever is not genuine will not last friendship that has issues will not last but what is genuine what is of god you know when gamaliel told the people these people that you are disturbing if this thing is of god you will be wasting your time and sometimes it's like that uh, I treasure, I treasure people, I treasure friendship, and people treasure you. Uh, now now I'm, 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 I'm so happy and fulfilled that you see the, some of the younger priests that I mentored. Now look after me very well. <laughs> I don't like. And these young priests, uh, when they travel, they bring me gifts, you know. Uh, uh, I had people like Father Yenes, Father John, studying in Rome. I, I don't like Roman colors now. They bring me these things. And, uh, and you see, I, I was not the one who motivated them. I just I only inspired them. They were my students as well. You cannot, you cannot come between a student and a teacher. It's not like me and people like that. You know, Master Gomez was my... I have a special love for them. I remember what they did for, for me. How they supported me. How they had... How they had favors for me, uh, Master, Master, Master Gomez, Master Francis Gomez, my first teacher in school, who realized when I came in, I didn't even know the alphabet. I didn't even know the one, two, three. He took particular interest in me. He saw, he saw good in me. He saw that this guy, if we support him, and he really supported me. And at, at some stage, he told the boys, if if you have problem with father, with Bruno, I will beat you. <laughs> if Bruno has a problem with you, I will beat you instead. <laughs> So, and I went to St. Peter's and I got Father Coleman there. So, you see, Father Coleman, people thought he was a tough priest here. But Father Coleman was my good friend. Because he knew me. You know people from when they are young. He knew me growing up. He knew me in school. That this guy wasn't giving trouble. <laughs> that this guy was hard working. So, when I came back to the diocese, he was Vicar General. He looked after me. So, when I, when I think about all these things, I must reciprocate to the awards. I, I must give. I must give from my heart. Hmm? Uh, Peter said, silver and gold have I not to give. But in the name of Jesus, rise up and walk. I may not be able to give them silver, but I can give them my support. I can give them my guidance. I can give them my advice. And, and many of them appreciate it. Hmm? Many of them appreciate it. That's why I say I'm a recruiter. I'm not a recruiter. <laughs> Jesus is the ultimate recruiter. Maybe I inspire and I, I help, I support. And, and, and not only even not, not only a priest, but even religious. Even religious. Sometimes you fall into trouble with some of their superiors who have other intentions and other thoughts about you. But me, I don't. When you have a clear conscience, you're a happy person. Indeed. Yes. So I support anybody who comes my way. Anybody who needs to be counseled, who needs to be directed. To bring you do it over and over again. I'll go there tomorrow. <laughs> I'll go to the seminary today and I'll go there tomorrow. I, 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 was, I, was, I was preaching at uh, one of my staff's um, wedding. Dominic, people call him my boy. But you see, I, I have that thing of you know, uh, establishing lasting relationship with people. Dominic came, a very shy guy, walking in St. Peter's. And, uh, and I, I, I tried to help and support him and make him, uh, make him grow, be what he is today. And I went to, I invited me to preside at, uh, to, at the Eucharistic celebration of his wedding. And I said to him, I gave him my own example. I said to him, you are married today. He try to be a happy man. Try to be a happy, happy couple. I told him, mother, be like me, I'm a happy priest. <laughs> yes, there is no need to go into marriage and begin to mourn or go into the priesthood and begin to, to cry and complain about toughness and things like that. No. And the happiness is from within. Mm -hmm. Me, I try to be a happy priest. Every day I get up and I want to be happy. And I commit that happiness to God. Yes, that God made me a happy priest. And I said to him, be happy. Be a happy husband. I said to the wife, be a happy wife, be a happy couple. 
the problems here and there will come tensions, will come disappointments, will come difficulties, will come. But there must be that inner joy in you, and only Jesus can give it. Not the couple, not the partner, not somebody else. Jesus gives that happiness. And I thank God that I am in love with Jesus. That's why I, I will tell you now about my new motto. <laughs> my new motto is, Lord, you know everything. You know I love you. I want to live the rest of my life striving each day to love Jesus. That's what I want to do now. I know that Jesus cares, that his grace is sufficient for me. I know that he is my shepherd. There is nothing I shall want. Now it is my turn to reciprocate. I just want to live like Peter. You know, when, when Jesus came to Peter, when Peter came to Jesus, Peter confronted Jesus. Simon, son of John, do you love me? Every Easter time we read that text of scripture. Really, I have just grown in love with that text of scripture now, Gospel of John. As I was contemplating my jubilee and the text for, for, for the Mass, the Thanksgiving Mass, I, I, I really was inspired to go to that text of scripture, that text of John. And Peter was asked, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And he said, yes, I love you, Lord. And the second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? At that time, we are told Peter was upset. He was guilty deep down in his heart. He was guilty. He knew where Jesus was going. He knew Jesus remembered his betrayal. And how three times before the cock sounded, he had said, I, did not, I do not know him. I want to take those, that answer of Peter. But when Peter said, Lord, you know everything. We thought he was upset. Lord, you know everything. You know I love you. For me, that is, that is what I want to live for the rest of my life. Whether one year, two years, ten years, twenty years. Whether I will celebrate my golden jubilee. But at first, I just want to celebrate his golden jubilee. be there but really now that is for me that is the priesthood for me the priesthood for me is trying to love God trying to love Jesus being able to say like Peter Lord you know everything the Lord knows me he knows that I'm not a perfect guy that I'm a sinful priest he knows I try to make the effort I'm only trying he knows everything but I want the Lord to know that I love him deep down in my heart from the day I knew him, I don't remember when I knew Jesus. When knowing God for me, knowing Jesus for me, is having him as my Lord and Savior. I don't remember. Some people say the day they knelt before the altar. I didn't kneel before any altar. But the day I, from the day I knew Jesus, I know that he loves me. And now it is my turn. Maybe I have not loved him enough. So my next journey, is to want to love him each day, to love him more and more. I go to the church sister sometimes. I used to go very regularly when I was a freelance priest, but now I'm not a freelance, I'm a parish priest. When I was a freelance, I, I went to the charity sisters every two days, every Wednesday and every uh, every Wednesday and every Saturday. For 18 years, I, I went to the chapel for mass, except when I traveled. And, and they have prayer after communion. And, and this mental prayer they say, and in one of the verses, that I may love thee more and more. They pray that Jesus may help them to love him more and more. That is my prayer now. So I want to be able to say with Peter, Lord, you know everything. Even as we speak now, telling Jesus, Lord, you know everything. No, I love you. That's my, <laughs> my, my dream now. Yeah. To live that with Jesus for the rest of my years. To try to love Jesus in his people, in his world. Amen. Now, before we go, we would like to ask you the last question. Why is Manchester United this bad? <laughs> we're not that bad now. We are the revival. 
that's my that's my dream team. Mm -hmm. And you know, sometimes when I preach about heaven, I tell people, I long for that day when I will arrive at the gates of heaven. And uh, and Jesus will say to me, Bruno, come you whom my father has blessed. Take for your heritage the kingdom prepared for you since the foundation of the world. And I'll take my, the key of my mansion from Peter. I don't want a room. I want a mansion in heaven. And I'll take the key of my mansion and I'll go to my room. And the first thing I will do is I will put the, the TV on. And I will see Manchester United playing football. <laughs> and beating all these big teams around the world. Barcelona and Real Madrid and Chelsea and Arsenal. That's my vision of heaven. It will be a happy day. Manchester United. They are in my heart. But we are, we are not doing very well these days, like in those days when I was a younger man, you know, and we, we beat every team and we won every trophy in England and we won the treble. But we are getting back there. But life is like that, in ups and downs. That's, a, that's why I always tell people. You know, sometimes people come here and say, Father, we had sports and I was in sports and they're not doing well. I always tell them, do you know Manchester United? That's my team. They used to beat everybody. But now they're not beating anybody. Ten years running plus now. And that is life. That's why when we are up there, we should try to be up there. We should work so hard to maintain the, the status quo, to maintain these things that as soon as we begin to form the fool and take things for granted, and when we crumble to go back up, it's, it's tough. Even in our spiritual journey. You see, the spiritual fathers always say, let us always look at the way of the cross. When Jesus fell under the weight of the cross for the first time, he didn't stay there. He got up and he moved on. He fell again the second time. He didn't stay there. He got up and he moved on and then fell a third time and he went up to Calvary and he walked. Our life is like that too. Someone just said, <laughs> it's bad. But it's an example to all of us that we should never take things for granted. Maybe they took things for granted. They were winning everybody in England. They were even winning people in Europe. And maybe they took things for granted. And then they fell from grace. And now when you fall from grace to come back, it's tough. But anyway, we shall be there one day. We are coming gradually. Indeed. We'll be there one day. Manchester will, will, will shine again. All you supporters of Manchester, I love you. <laughs> Don't move to Barcelona or to Chelsea or to Liverpool. You are wasting your time. We'll be back. We'll be back again. Life will be great. But in heaven, only Manchester United will be beating teams. You better join us now. <laughs> Indeed. Finally, Father, we say congratulations mm -hmm. and the best wishes. We always continue to pray for you and your ministry. And we thank you for all the sacrifices um, that you make on behalf of Christian um, Panorama. We love you so much. Do you have any um, last words? Yeah, I just want to say I love Christian Panorama. It's, it's, it, it has propelled me to another level, to a higher level, vis-a-vis uh, -vis evangelization. Uh, uh, with, with Christian Panorama, I have, a, I have a wider vision that yes, I'm punished with the Holy Spirit, but I'm a priest for all nations. That's what we are as priests, we are priests for all people. And with Christian Panorama, I have, I have a broader vision of evangelization. That you can sit in your room and evangelize and speak to the world and speak to people who may want to hear the word of God in your room. And that is what I experienced during the pandemic. That I could stay in my chapel and be in tune with a few people, but in different parts of the world. I know when I started that some people in my parish didn't like that. But today they have accepted it. You see, there are certain things we do not like, but that doesn't mean that they are. We are right. Mm -hmm. And Christian Panorama has widened my horizon about life. Uh, I love Tijan, the, the, the founder of Christian Panorama. He had this vision many years ago, was it 12 years ago, 13 years ago. Who knew that to come to this the first media to blow Christianity? Gambian Christianity, to, to challenge Gambian Christianity, to challenge the world, not only Gambian Christianity, to challenge the world. So I want to thank Christian Panorama for mm -hmm. our capturing all the membership. Mm -hmm. And I want 
to, to pay tribute to Madeline, our sister, who has gone before us, Margaret, a sign of faith, a woman who was full of energy for Jesus and wanted to reach out to people. I want to pay tribute to her and I thank her. And I pray that the Lord may welcome her into paradise. Amen. And I want to thank all people. I want to thank my bishop. Uh, who ordained me, Bishop uh, Clare, I want to give thanks to Bishop Ellison, who took over from him, I want to give thanks to uh, Bishop uh, Gabriel Mendy, I give thanks to Bishop uh, Sapo, in, Peter Sapo in, in, in Liberia, who ordained me, and one of my professors has become a bishop in Sierra Leone, Bishop Tamba Charles. Was also my prophet in seminary, somebody who loved me and so good in me and challenged me to work hard. I want to pay tribute to him, to, to thank him for his love and care. He's the Archbishop of Freetown and Bow. But I want to thank uh, my parishioners, my family, in uh, preparing a big celebration for me. I want to thank them all. I want to thank my diaspora parishioners and friends. <laughs> Who are so good and kind to me, and uh, they have been very supportive. And these days, they are sending me gifts for my jubilee. I want to thank them. I want to thank people in this country, fellow priest, uh, my 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 soulmate, Father Antoine. Uh, I journeyed with him. Really, we journeyed we journeyed a long way. I want to thank him for his partnership. Uh, we, we are counterparts. <laughs> they even called us counterparts in seminary. I want to thank my family, my parents in absentia. I know they are in heaven looking from the window. I want to thank all of them, but I want to thank Gambians, my friends, uh, fellow Christians in this country. People have really been nice to me. I want to thank them. I thank my fellow teachers, my staff, my students you know, from yesterday to now. I want to thank all of them. I taught in St. Augustine's Junior Secondary School. I taught in St. Peter's here. Now my students at the university have 99 in my class at the moment, and uh, they are all nice people to me. I thank uh, all the authorities in the church, in the state. I have a special friend in the state house, the, the first lady, and uh, and she tells me she was they are also celebrating 25 years. I want to congratulate uh, uh, President Adam Barrow and uh, the first lady. Uh, Madame Barrow on the occasion of the 25th anniversary of their wedding. So we are together. Sunday I will remember you. Saturday and Sunday I will remember you in prayer and pray for you that the Lord may bind you together and bless you together and also bless uh, uh, your children and your family. I want to say thanks to everybody. I'm a very happy man. I'm a very lucky man. I'm a very blessed man to have all of you in my life. I thank God for all of you uh, and may God richly bless all of you in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Father Bruno. Um, I want to take this opportunity to thank uh, Big Boy, our cameraman, who has also um, contributed positively um, towards this interview. Uh, if you're just joining us, this is Christian Panorama, our Christian lad, coming, you li coming to you live from Banjo. We also want to take this opportunity to wish you a Merry Christmas and a prosperous um, new year. And may the coming year be a year of difference for us in the diocese of Banjo, in our community, in our workplaces, um, even in on the streets, wherever we may be. May this coming year be a year of change and may Christ continue to bind us together like never before. Maybe you give us to view us the one day for taking your time to um, watch Christian Panorama while Christian that today we had Father Bruno two pines celebrating 25 years and also continue to remember him in your prayers and may God in his infinite mercy continue to shower his blessings upon him and also elevate his ministry um, so that he will continue to evangelize um, the word of God because most of the time we see him on our Christian Panorama page while and also to thank um, the members of CP Christian Panorama as we continue to pray um, for our sister Madeline Rune. May her soul continue to rest in peace until we come again. Your time.
And thank you very much coming to you live from Banjo. It's a bye-bye.